Resveratrol is often hyped as an anti-aging wonder, but beneath the excitement lies a disappointing, unfortunate story that once I learned the details last year, it was enough for me to stop taking resveratrol. In this video, I want to reshare those details with you and expand upon some crucial points so that you can make an informed decision about whether you want to take resveratrol or not. Let's get into it. The excitement around resveratrol kicked into overdrive in the early 2000s after some researchers such as Dr. Matt Caberline showed that by doubling the amount of an enzyme called SIR2 in yeast, it resulted in a roughly 30% increase in lifespan. It was also suggested that the SIR2 gene was responsible for the beneficial effects of calorie restriction. In mammals like mice and humans, we've got seven of these SIR2 genes, and the one that most closely resembles the original SIR2 gene in yeast is sirtuin-1. So now the race is on to find molecules that can hopefully activate sirtuin-1 and give these lifespan extension benefits, which brings us on to a 2003 paper published by David Sinclair's lab. In it, they showed that resveratrol is a potent activator of sirtuin-1. Now, that research is in single-cell petri dishes. Now we need to figure out what happens when you give resveratrol to mice. So that's exactly what they did in 2006, where they showed that obese mice, when given resveratrol, they could live almost as long as otherwise healthy mice. On the back of this excitement and intellectual property, a company called Sertris was co-founded by Dr. David Sinclair. This captured the attention of the pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline, or GSK, who purchased Sertris for the sum of $720 million in 2008. So it sounded like a wonderful story that we've got quality research showing potential lifespan extension benefits, and the original researchers, they made bank. They made $720 million. But then things started to fall apart. There were mutterings that maybe the original Satuan data and the resveratrol data was flawed. So let's start with the foundational idea of activating sirtuins. So there were research papers showing that if you activate sirtuins, you can extend the lifespan of flies and worms. However, those effects on aging, they are vulnerable to co-founding effects because of the genetic background. So in 2010, a large group of researchers got together to redo these trials, but they wanted to make sure that the experiment was bulletproof, that they controlled for all of these variables. Unfortunately, what they found is that that when you conduct the experiment properly and you standardize the genetic background as well as using appropriate controls, there were no benefits seen for either worms or flies. They also found that the benefits from calorie restriction had nothing to do with the SIR2 gene. This is a massive deal because the overall theory is that resveratrol would boost sirtuin 1, but here we've got quality data showing that by boosting sirtuins, you're not going to see effects. Now, it's important to note here that Dr. Matt Caberline's research, which was done in yeast, that is reproducible. It's when you try and test the Satuan theories in worms that things don't seem to pan out. Overall, though, the idea that activating Satuans is flawed, and this is evidenced by that large 2011 paper, as well as researchers such as Dr. Matt Caberline speaking out about the Satuan theory on Dr. Peter Atia's podcast. So let's have a listen in. Funny because, you know, people who are in the field, I think sometimes think of me as this anti sirtuin guy, which is absolutely not the truth. I'm the guy, I'm the guy who first showed that you could overexpress a sirtuin and increase lifespan. If anybody's going to be pro sirtuin, it's So again, that's in yeast. Me. I think the problem is that I've seen a lot of data that has that people have struggled to reproduce, right? And and I and I just honestly don't know how to interpret that. So that's the first thing to establish, that overactivating the SIR2 gene in either worms or fruit flies, as well as mice, it doesn't appear to work. So why then would it have positive effects in humans? There's even some evidence that blocking the SIR2 gene in certain conditions would extend lifespan. This is a massive problem for the resveratrol theory. But even if we ignored that and you still wanted to activate the sirtuin one gene, even that data is flawed. This is Matt Cableline again on my channel. Almost. Um, so, so, you know, that title, I think, says it all. We didn't say that resveratrol doesn't activate SIR2 or SIR T1. What it does is it only activates SIR2 and SIR T1 towards a very limited subset of potential targets. And I think the question at the time, and to some extent still the question, is whether or not resveratrol can activate sirtuins toward any targets that are relevant 
in a cell or for aging. And at least in yeast, our conclusion was the answer is no, that when you treat yeast cells with resveratrol, you don't get any activation of SIR2 towards its normal targets, and you don't get lifespan extension. And that was different than what um, had been previously published by the Sinclair lab. And, you know, nobody, to my knowledge, has ever been able to replicate that initial study from the Sinclair lab where they claimed lifespan extension from resveratrol. So, you know, I, I can't tell you why we didn't get the same result. All I can tell you is we didn't get the same result. And then we looked at the biochemistry. And what we found is that, that um, indeed, resveratrol can activate sirtuins, but it's only towards this, this very specific artificial substrate that, that is relevant, what we call in vitro, outside of cells. So let's go through that and unpack what Dr. Cableline just said. In 2009, a separate lab wanted to relook at the idea that resveratrol could actually activate sirtuin-1. Shockingly, what they found is that it wasn't the resveratrol that was activating sirtuin-1. It was a fluorescent dye. And resveratrol by itself does not activate sirtuin-1. To make matters worse, another separate lab in 2010 published the same thing. That it wasn't resveratrol that was activating sirtuin-1. It was the fluorescent dye. So the idea that resveratrol activates sirtuin-1 is nothing more than a lab error, as per those separate research groups. So overactivating sirtuins isn't a strong idea based on the data that we've gone through, and besides any of that, even if you wanted to activate sirtuins, it doesn't look like resveratrol does activate sirtuin-1. Instead, it seems that the initial hype was nothing more than poorly conducted experiments. At this point in time, the pharmaceutical company GSK had a 720 million dollar problems on their hand and to make matters worse they were currently conducting human trials so they were burning even more money trying to evaluate the idea of sirtuin 1 and resveratrol so now the pressure is on dr david sinclair's lab to explain all of this they need to find a way to show that resveratrol can activate sirtuin 1 without that fluorescent dye which brings us on to a 2013 paper so remember, the initial resveratrol studies are flawed because of the fluorescent dye. The experiments wouldn't work without that fluorescent dye. So what the Sinclair lab needs to do is find a naturally occurring peptide or substrate that will allow resveratrol to work and actually activate the sirtuins. And that's what they found. The fluorescein dye is dispensable if it's replaced with naturally occurring amino acids. Specifically, complete amino acid sequences of peptides bearing tryptophan. So yes, you can make resveratrol activate the 2 in 1, but it's in a very, very, very specific way that can only happen in a controlled environment. How relevant is that to aging and longevity? Well, it isn't. A 2020 trial used the latest CRISPR technology to see exactly how resveratrol is working in normal cells. What they found is that resveratrol, it stresses the cells. It does not activate the 2 in 1. And I just want to read the concluding remarks here. These results establish that the primary impact of resveratrol on human cells is replicative stress. Again, in the normal human body, resveratrol would not activate the 2 in 1, but under specific conditions, in the lab, it can. And because of that technicality, GSK, they couldn't get their $720 million back because there is an environment where resveratrol can activate sirtuins, even though it's a stretch and doesn't really reflect the real world. Now, a massive drug company like GSK, they're not going to back down. They're going to do everything in their power to try and salvage the situation. But there's multiple issues that they need to resolve. Resveratrol is poorly absorbed. The small amount that is absorbed, it's quickly broken down by the liver. And unless there's very, very specific conditions, resveratrol isn't going to activate sirtuin-1. And to cap things off, the underlying idea that activating sirtuin-1 for health benefits is shaky at best. So, they developed a molecule called SRT501 to try and improve the absorption of resveratrol. It was trialed in multiple myeloma patients, and unfortunately that trial was stopped due to severe side effects, including kidney damage. That version of resveratrol was discontinued. They then started to develop new activators of sirtuin-1 that were completely different to resveratrol, but importantly they seemed to be able to activate sirtuin-1. Unfortunately though, for their lead compound, the clinical outcomes had neutral or statistically insignificant results. And it's not surprising, again, the underlying idea that activating sirtuin-1, again, is shaky at best. 
After all of these failures and around $1 billion lost, in 2013, GSK decided to shutter Searcher's Pharmaceuticals. They stopped developing resveratrol. So what we've gone through is a lot of preclinical data that unfortunately hasn't panned out. So what do the human clinical trials show? Well, over 150 separate resveratrol trials have been done, and unfortunately, resveratrol has had a neutral effect. Let's take a look at this one for example. It's a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind trial, and it was looking at low-grade inflammation caused by obesity. They used resveratrol doses up to 1,000 milligrams every day for 16 weeks. Resveratrol, it did not improve any aspect of inflammation. Worryingly though, resveratrol, it did increase cholesterol levels. So overall, what we can see from the human clinical trials that have been done, and there's been a lot of them, there's no clear benefit by taking resveratrol. Now, we have gone through that CRISPR paper that looked at how resveratrol actually influences human cells, and it stresses them. So then the question is, is that stress good for our cells? Because we stress our cells when we exercise. So what if we combine resveratrol and exercise? That's exactly what this trial did of 27 men. Half of them took placebo and the other half resveratrol, and both groups participated in high intensity exercise training. What the authors found is that resveratrol, it stops the positive effects of exercise, as measured by VO2 max. A second, larger trial of 43 people found the same thing. So it doesn't look like the stress that resveratrol puts on our cells is beneficial. So for example, when we smoke or when we drink too much alcohol, that also stresses our cells. But clearly that stress is not good for our bodies, and it appears to be the same thing with resveratrol. So there's multiple issues with resveratrol. It's poorly absorbed, it's quickly broken down. The idea of activating sirtuins is shaky at best. Even if we wanted to activate the sirtuins, it doesn't look like resveratrol does it in a normal human being. And worse than that, resveratrol stresses the cells in such a way that it blunts the positive effects of exercise. So in that way, resveratrol is harmful to humans. And I do want to ask you a question here. Resveratrol has been intensely investigated for almost two decades with well over $1 billion spent. If resveratrol was an amazing molecule giving these lifespan extension benefits and health benefits, surely we should be seeing some robust data, but there's none. We've almost finished this unfortunate tale, but there is one more crucial detail that I want to share. One of the arguments as to why resveratrol hasn't panned out in the clinical trials is because of poor absorption. So let's ignore all of the other problems with resveratrol that we've gone through, and let's go down the rabbit hole of poor absorption. Here is Dr. Sinclair on Dr. Peter Atia's podcast where he talks about the resveratrol issues regarding absorption. Cells, right? If the resveratrol had greater absorption with and without a fatty food that's resulted in bile acids uh, secretion. Yeah, well, we didn't measure bile acids, but we could definitely see by measuring blood levels that resveratrol was getting on board when we gave some fat in the food. And that's true in humans. That's why if I take resveratrol, uh, I do it with a, something that's fatty food. Fatty. Basically. So some oil, a yogurt it works really well. Got it. Okay, well, that's so that's elegant. Okay, so then. Three studies come out thereafter. Two of them were ITPs. So they're about to go into the research from the interventions testing program. Why this is such a big deal is that the interventions testing program, they use genetically heterogeneous mice. Essentially what this does is that it means that the mice, they're not inbred. They actually match the human population because we are genetically diverse. And every single experiment that they do, they run that experiment three times in separate labs to see if the result that they're finding is true. So that's why often the interventions testing program is helpful up as the creme de la creme of mice data. Resveratrol was investigated using different dosages and at different age groups. So because the interventions testing program trialed resveratrol twice, they actually ran the experiments six times. What they found is that resveratrol did not extend lifespan. Here is what Dr. David Sinclair had to say about that. What did those studies find, the the ITPs? Uh, They just showed what we already published, which is that if you give resveratrol in regular food, it doesn't extend lifespan. And why did they, why couldn't that have been overcome? I mean, that seems like they should have given that you'd already, because you published yours in 06. These were like 08 and 11 or 11, 12, something like these were several years later. Sure. Well, the, the, yeah, those scientists didn't consult me at all. Um, they just put in the food and 
Okay, so that's a crucial point. Let's have a look at what the interventions testing program authors of that paper had to say, because they did consult Dr. Sinclair. We're about to hear from Dr. Richard Miller, who is the overall architect of the interventions testing program. So the second part of your question was, how did this influence our decision to test resveratrol? And the answer, this is behind the scenes gossip, but it's completely true, is that we were ordered to test it. Richard Hodas, the director of the National Institute on Aging, was very impressed with resveratrol. And like you, he was getting, I'm sure, hundreds or thousands <laughs> of questions uh, a year, requests say, why don't you guys test resveratrol? So resveratrol did not go through our usual screening process. This was a directive from the top. This was a, the only time this has happened. We were instructed, you will be testing resveratrol. And I called David Sinclair and said, what, what dose should we use? The same. So he's actively asking David Sinclair's advice on the dose of resveratrol dose that you used in your paper and he said no 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 that's much too low use at least five times ten times twenty times higher so we followed david's advice and also checked with his close friend and colleague rafa de cavo to get advice on dose so the two doses that we used for resveratrol were i'd have to look it up either three times and ten times higher than in the original Sinclair paper, maybe it was 10 and 30 times. I'd, I have to check my notes to get that exactly right. But we used both doses, both high. And then we started at two different ages because we were told to do start some of the mice in youth and others of the mice in middle age. And we did that and it had no effect on longevity. And we were, I think, the first of three or four groups, including Sinclair and DeCavo later on, to show that resveratrol given to mice on a normal diet does not extend their lifespan. So there you go. And Dr. David Sinclair is listed as one of the authors of those interventions testing program papers, so he must have been consulted. So let's sum things up. The foundational idea behind resveratrol is that we want to activate sirtuin 1, but there's no robust data behind that. Resveratrol in normal human cells doesn't activate sirtuin 1 anyway. The only way that it can work is in a very, very, very specific environment that does not match the real world. There's no robust human data supporting resveratrol's benefits in humans, but we do have reproducible data about resveratrol's harms in humans, specifically blunting the positive effects of exercise. And when tested by the meticulous interventions testing program, who did ask Dr. David Sinclair's opinion about how to run these experiments, there was no lifespan extension seen. I remade this video because I wish that I knew all of this information before I started taking resveratrol, and I also want to expand on some crucial points. In my previous video that I did almost a year ago, I didn't go into the 2013 paper that Dr. Sinclair uses as a rebuttal for why resveratrol does activate sirtuins. But I hope this gives some food for thought about the research on resveratrol and why resveratrol isn't used in the clinical field, because again we don't have robust human data yet showing any benefits. And please let me know in the comment section what you thought of this video. Have I missed anything or is there anything that you want me to dive into a bit more detail about. I'm sure I can reach out again to people like Dr. Matt Caberline or Professor Brian Kennedy, Dr. Charles Brenner. We can ask them specific questions and maybe get a different perspective. Anyway, a massive thank you to all of the patrons who support the channel. And until next time, thanks very much.